Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ira. It's lovely to be here, and I really appreciate all the work you've done to pull the webinars together and um, all of the efforts with the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium. Um, and I am very proud to announce our um, first webinar, as you've um, noted, for our International Perspectives webinar series, identifying some of the biggest challenges and greatest needs in our communities through the international lens. Um, I welcome all of our attendees today. I hope that you learn a great deal from our webinar and join me in welcoming Jonathan Gosling. Uh, Professor Gosling is co-founder of the One Planet Education Networks and of the One Planet MBA at Exeter University and is currently an emeritus professor of leadership, international consultant, and member of the NGO major group contributing to achievement of the SDGs. Today's talk is going to be um, building on a book that he has co-authored titled Sustainable Business, a One Planet Approach. So please, again, join me in welcoming Jonathan Gosling, and we'll hand the mic and video and screen to you. Thank you very much, Kim and, and Ira, and uh, greetings to people who uh, I presume are out there. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, talk to you and, and I suppose articulate uh, some of the lessons that I think I've been learning and continue to learn about how business schools can contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals and to sustainability uh, more broadly. Um, I'm going to uh, focus today specifically on uh, business schools and what they can and can't do um, from at least uh, from my experience and some of the difficulties we've had and some of the opportunities I think we're spotting in here um, and as Kim said I shall be referring along the way to the uh, textbook published by Wiley called Sustainable Business a One Planet Approach uh, which really takes through a, a particular perspective on the curriculum uh, for MBA type education. Uh, I'm not going to go through that book chapter by chapter or uh, or, or dwell on the contents of it, any of the chapters in particular, but I've structured my talk to, I hope, exemplify uh, some of the principles that were set out in that book. Um, uh, so I'm going to do my best now to run through these slides. And I think you've I've probably got the camera on so you can see me. I, uh, I think I'm, I'll switch that off so it's not too distracting. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's, uh, I guess, nice to, to see a face. Um, now, here we come here. Uh, so uh, this uh, idea of a one planet business education and a one planet MBA came to me after working for, for quite a while with WWF International, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And as I, I guess many of you will be familiar, the WWF published for many years an excellent report, uh, the, the Living Planet Report, which developed a kind of metric and a dashboard that measured how uh, rapidly we were using the Earth's resources in any given given year. So the framework was, was an annual one. In an annual cycle, uh, how quickly are we getting through the capacity of the earth to reproduce uh, the, the um, gases that we depend on to live, uh, the, the biodiversity, the plants, the food, and so on. Um, and this report published every two years is, uh, is and I think has become a fascinating uh, way of of examining not only the kind of difficulties we're in, uh, but also some of the successes we've been having. So for example, uh, the most recent one showed significant recovery in a number of marine stocks, for example, and de demonstrating the effectiveness of good conservation practice. Um, but, but generally speaking, the, uh, the general picture has been that in the world as a whole, we are consuming a our planet's resources at about one and a half times the speed at which uh, the planet can reproduce those resources. Uh, and this isn't equally spread around the world. For those of us living in Europe, we're generally living a life as if we had 3.4 planets. 
uh, of resources to, to live on. And in North America, that number is about six planets. So the average North American lifestyle uh, is is really conducted on the assumption that there are six planet Earths that we can draw on in each year. Uh, of course, that's impossible. Uh, so, and, and in many ways, one has to say, well, the lifestyles that we in Europe and, and most of you in North America are living are patently absurd. But we're doing it and we can do it at the moment because we're drawing down on reserves and we're taking capacity from other parts of the world that are not uh, living those kinds of lifestyles. And so the approach to business education that I've been pursuing for some time and that underlies this term one planet business education is, is one that really simply asks what would we want to teach our business people, how would we conduct business if we started from the assumption that we have only one planet and we're explicit about that throughout. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about uh, now is my, the lessons I've learned from trying to get that message through to and, and make this a real practice within business education. So I'm going to uh, talk about the extent of whether the kinds of change we need can be understood as incremental or radical. Uh, I'm going to examine a bit business school readiness for change and refer to the kinds of business models that schools operate under, uh, which might indicate where there is opportunity for change. Um, I'm going to refer a little bit more to some of the characteristics of One Planet Business Education uh, and some of the things that we can do about it. Um, uh, so uh, I want to start off with a little bit about my own thinking about leadership and about what's required in leading change. Um, and I've, I've been for a long time a professor of leadership and studying in many different contexts how leadership happens. And some of the research questions we've been asking are, are these, and I guess those of you will be familiar with, with these sorts of questions. What are the qualities of a good leader? And, uh, what does a leader do uh, and what are the results of leadership? Um, and uh, I, I think one of the uh, best starting points I had for this, I've done it this in many different, these, asked these questions in many sectors, was uh, was working with seven-year-olds. Um, and we held a number of focus groups. And we had them draw pictures and describe and talk about uh, their answers to these questions. And, th and this is what they said about what makes a good leader. Uh, oops, I don't know where that's gone to. They referred to a head teacher. This is, a, I don't know what's happened to the title here, but a head teacher should have big ears, long arms, and high heels. Uh, and you might ask, well, why is that? Well, here's the answer. Ah, uh, no, I've lost that one. I'm going to have to do something clever so you can see the last one here. Hang on a minute. Ah, uh, that's not going to work, is it? Well, the answer of why she should have to have, have high heels, <laughs> I don't know why that screen's gone strange, uh, why, she, why she should have high heels is because, so she can be seen in assembly, so everyone can see her in assembly. Uh, I think these answers, they're, they're very sweet, aren't they? A, a, a head teacher should have big ears to hear naughty children whispering, log arms to make sad children feel okay, and high heels so everyone can see her. Uh, but this, this says a lot about what we require of leaders. Uh, that is discipline, care, and visibility. Discipline, care, and visibility. And uh, but, but, uh, but children had uh, a kind of limited perspective of some of the other questions. When you ask what does a leader do, uh, they, they seem to think it was this. Uh, empirically speaking, they're probably right. Uh, she spends a lot of time in her office eating biscuits. Um, and what should the results be? Well, she should make sure that everything stays all right. Um, well, we would all like to have a leader who makes everything stays all right. This is Dumbledore from um, uh, Harry Potter. Uh, from uh, who, who... You've lost your screen. Uh oh, you've lost my screen. Uh, your slides. Oh, can you see them now? Hello. Yep, it still says waiting to see your screen. My goodness. Let me take Can you see them back. now? Let me take it back for a second and and then I'll switch it back to you. And hang on. 
There we go. Are we back? I'm sending it back. He's getting there. Again now. You should see the the prompt box for you to accept. There you go. I knew we didn't want to miss that slide. You don't want to miss this slide. This is Dumbledore. This is our ideal desired leader who makes everything all right and who manages the academy with such an accuracy and a, and a deal of magic and a fine mixture of secrets uh, and fundamental honesty and trust. Um, but I, I guess most of us experience leadership in our universities and business schools a little differently to that. Um, and in fact, I've done some research on that and uh, these are the answers when, when i asked people in universities and some other knowledge-based industries uh what characterizes their leaders these are the sorts of things they said um nice that they're strategic ambitious and visionary and so on but of course they're also seen as dogmatic ruthless self-centered uh stressed um disliking ambiguity um, ignorant of history and its lessons and so on i mean clearly real life leaders the people who are actually making decisions in our real organizations are or at least we see them as uh you know, complex somewhat and we're somewhat ambivalent about their motives about their wisdom and their goodness um, of course, these seven-year-olds I described before were describing their ideal leaders. Uh, and here we're asking a question, well, who's actually running the place? And this is what I think is tremendously important to pay attention to when we start thinking about the changes we can make in business education. Who are we dealing with? What are, what's the real politique of uh, business school? And so I want to address that a little bit now, um, because business schools are actually tremendously complex ecosystems systems. Uh, this, uh, this picture, I suppose, makes them seem wonderfully colourful and uh, lively and, and healthy. And hopefully most of them are, actually, certainly compared to many other parts of the economy. Uh, but what, what is going on in business schools uh, is a, a very complex interaction of interests. Uh, and this next picture may perhaps describe this uh, a, a, a little better. Um, this is a picture of a European meeting, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, with Brexit and all those things. Uh, our experience uh, at the moment of trying to figure out a common agenda and figure out what is in the interests of all in a shared mission, as well as uh, what each of the players want and are prepared to do. It's, a, it's very complex and I think most, I think this picture could also describe most business school or university or faculty life where we do all get together to, 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 in some occasions on the same campus or under the same banner. Uh, but we also have a plurality of interests. Uh, there are so many other things going on and what, what I think is interesting in this picture is you can see particularly the people in the foreground, uh, actually, actually almost none of them are looking at each other. Uh, they've all sort of looking to some other agenda and this is even in the years before mobile phones and uh, uh, and as, as if they've got other things to think about and uh, pay attention to rather than just being here in this lovely party together with everyone else on the ship so when we come to think about change in business schools to bring about a more sustainable uh, curriculum and that the, the the top level argument is business should and business education should promote sustainable uh, business and activity it should contribute to sustainable development goals and so on this is an easy enough thing to say but the reality of it is we have to deal with people who are trying to meet many different agendas uh, because of course faculty members are seldom rewarded just for their teaching uh, they also have to bring in research grants and they have to make uh, contributions to publications, quite often publications that are a long way from practical impact. Um, even in institutions that are more primarily dedicated to, to education and teaching, to keep those priorities to the foremost and the impact of that education to the foremost is often a real struggle for the frontline teachers in the face of institutional requirements which drive ever larger numbers and squeeze the money and so on 
so bringing about change in business model is actually very difficult. And to call for, for a, a radical transition towards sustainable oriented education is, in my experience, uh, very difficult. Um, and it, this is a picture I took the other day. I, I found an exhibition of, I think, the kind of uh, perspective one comes to half of oneself if you're trying to bring about change in a sort of holistic and idealistic way, uh, but you're being constantly confronted also that what counts as success are quite different things. Um, uh, and certainly at Exeter, when we started to, that's the university in the UK where I've worked for many years, uh, where we launched something called the One Planet MBA uh, about uh, eight years ago now, um, we were, uh, confronted with some quite uh, difficult questions when we when we started this thing, uh, the tactically difficult questions. Uh, we were reasonably clear that we wanted to start a, 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 a an MBA based on the assumption that we have only one planet, and we were reasonably clear that we could pull together uh, enough faculty members from all the different departments who were prepared to th think about their own disciplines from that perspective and make a start from that perspective. Um, so if I go back to this picture, uh, I, I think we, we, became, we, we pulled together a group that were a little bit like the, the group of people you can see in the background, sort of towards the middle and the left, who are actually quite, quite enthusiastic, excited, getting together, even looking overboard at what else is happening in other parts of the world. Um, but to try to get that agenda into the business school to bring it to the university was was really uh, quite hard work and I remember we had a, a very uh, interesting and quite quite um, uh, a tense faculty uh, board meeting school board meeting at that point in the, under the structure there were about I think 17 of us uh, on the executive board of the, of the business school and uh, I, I had proposed and it was on the agenda that we should close our current MBA and uh, reopen as a one planet MBA. Uh, the, uh, the, the dean said, well, uh, he thought we should have a, a sustainable MBA that sat alongside uh, all the others. Uh, you know, an MBA that was teaching innovation, one specializing on quantitative skills and so on. Um, I, I, I made the argument, I said, well, you know, you, you, you can't have a one planet MBA sitting next to a six planet MBA. You know, we've either got to think, believe we've only got one planet or we don't. Uh, and, and I made this point, we went round the room uh, with uh, the um, dean insisted that there should be unanimity if we were going to do that, a 100% vote in favour of, of a kind of radical step like that, relatively radical. Uh, and we went round the room one after another, every, everybody did vote that we should do that. Uh, it was uh, quite an astounding moment. I, I hadn't really believed it, it, I could pull that off. And, and, and so we did that. We closed down our existing MBAs and opened afresh. Um, there was a moment when people asked um, uh, the school manager in particular, find the person in charge of the finance, asked, what are we gonna do if we have a, a year or a couple of years with no income, if we're not running one, we, we need the, the money coming in. And she, we thought about it for a while, and she came up with the idea that said, well, what, what about, um, well, she, actually, she asked the question, who are the people who really know what a One Planet MBA should have in it? Uh, now that well, of course, it's, it's our faculty will figure it out as we go along. Um, but but also, it's people who are really at this kind of front line of business who are trying to to make businesses work uh, in a sustainable sustainability context and, and trying to make their businesses sustainable. What do they want to learn? What are the problems they're dealing with? What do they need to solve? What skills do they think they need? Um, so we ended up advertising and recruiting what we called an innovation cohort and we advertised for a once-in-a-lifetime chance to join an MBA program and help us co-create it and we ran that first year in uh, as a sort of co-creating lab where we uh, both taught and discussed and redefined it was very intense tremendously tiring and one of the most exciting educational experiences I've had to create that, uh, that innovation cohort of the One Planet MBA. Um, uh, and and, and you, you can, if you look it up online, I'm sure you can see more details on it. But I, I want to really draw some of the lessons we've had from that because it's been actually been very difficult to sustain. Um, and and one of them has been that you know, people who the people who put themselves forwards to work on this uh, one planet MBA to 
to, uh, to, to convert their teaching to do this uh, were really, we really had to trust each other in a quite extraordinary way because uh, there was a, first there was a lot of skepticism around here. There was a sense that, well, you may start teaching this, but you're never going to publish it. Uh, because there aren't enough outlets in this because the research that you're going to do isn't going to be uh, that, and that you're hoping to teach from isn't going to be uh, easily publishable in the premier journals um, and uh, and as, as I think this uh, photograph shows uh, it was we did sometimes feel that we'd entered into a very dangerous sort of pact amongst ourselves I think for, for me and, and one or two of the other more senior people, the risk wasn't so great. But I was definitely aware that for some of the more junior staff and the people who were on perhaps less secure contracts uh, were putting themselves in quite a, a difficult position uh, by taking this on. Um, so I did feel sometimes like uh, Janus, this is the, the uh, uh, Roman god who looks both ways. Uh, I mean, one interpretation is he's looking outside at the context and the other is he's looking inside at what's going on inside the city in the organization is temple sat at the, at the gates of rome um, but there's another sense in which uh i, I think someone who's leading uh, a, a change process to established curricula such as the uh the, the mba the business curriculum uh, has to be both speaking to the possibility of something different and, and making making it seem as if it, it's it would be crazy not to do this uh, but at the same time aware of the uh, risks that are being run in that and from the point of view of a uh, of someone who's leading that kind of effort as i was um, i realized that uh, uh, I had to be, I, I had to develop a kind of two-facedness in a more insidious way even than, than that, which I, that which I've just said. Uh, and let me try to explain that. I felt that on one hand, I was asserting and constructing and encouraging a kind of usness, a sense of a cadre of enthusiasts. Of people who strongly believed in the same thing, who would, who were part of a, of perhaps a, a, an in-group. We were part of an in-group. We were us, and that subjective unity was very important amongst us. That trust that we could develop, and yet at the same time, I had to stand kind of above that circle of trust and see now what of what is necessary for the achievement of our goals here. And sometimes for the achievement of our goals, I might have to do something or consider the possibility that I would have to do something that would be to the detriment of one of my cadre, one of our tribe, one of our in-group. I might have to say, well, we re I really appreciate your enthusiasm for this, but we just can't use it on this program. Or, um, or I, or I might have to say that uh, the the, uh, the wider interests of the project as a whole were uh, would, would meant that we we really had to you know, sort of push someone out of, the, of, of our tribe. And this, of course, is for the for somebody who faces that uh, experienced as a sense of betrayal, to put it strongly. Um, and this is even more so, this becomes especially so in a situation where you, you do have to build a tribe of activists to get something done like this. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, it's, uh, to, to bring about this kind of change in an organization, it really is, uh, it requires, I think, a kind of a steeliness, a genus-like steeliness. Um, that there was quite a shock for me, I think, in, in, in coming to that. And it's quite different from the, the sort of institutional leadership because when you're when you're running an institution as a whole, a whole department or a business school or something, uh, you 
it's sort of accepted that you have that diversity and plurality of interests and things to hold, to hold on to. Uh, but when you're head of a tribe, an usness, an in-group, that betrayal is all the harder uh, when one has to take that more objective perspective. So I think that people who want to try and bring about this kind of change do need to be prepared for this. And, uh, and I chose this picture by uh, Picasso. He, he made this picture of one of his greatest lovers, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and uh, I, I, although when I first looked at it, I thought, God, this is a confusing picture. Um, I, I, it, came, it became for me, it has become a, a kind of icon uh, of both how I think I need to be myself, multi-perspectival. And also, I, I need to try and see in other people and in the work we're doing multiple different motives and perspectives and angles on things. And this multi-perspectival uh, perspective is also sometimes at odds with the kind of evangelism that goes with arguing for the sort of change we are arguing with sustainability. So I think that, that leadership of this sort of change in organizations is particularly uh, demanding uh, to, to bring idealism into the business school context does create challenges which are not there uh, in many other kinds of changes one might want to bring about. Um, I want to now move on a little bit to what I think constitutes one planet uh, business education. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going to talk, talk about it in the context of a number of different sort of problematics, as, as you can probably tell by now. I'm, I'm, I'm not one for the sort of easy answer, but, but uh, this, this is a, a picture I took at uh, the um, Rio 2012 from the Earth Summit, uh, where I, I met Kim, actually. And um, uh, this was a lovely exhibition of children's faces printed onto umbrellas, um, which, is, which you can see really brightened up this rather uh, dull and airy uh, conference zone. Um, but I think it also speaks to something about the fragility, when I see this, the fragility of happiness of contentment of, of, uh, of our human family. And when we look at the context of our one planet, the sorts of things that are going on, the di particularly the displacement, the migration, the, the inequality, the poverty, the dependency on the war. I know that, that um, my country, the UK, uh, just made a, a $1.4 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia to uh, to sell arms that, that they're almost bound to use uh, destructively in Yemen and across the Middle East in, in ways that we wouldn't really want. And I see that the US, I think, has today agreed a similar deal about the same amount of money uh, with the same customer, presumably to the same ends. Uh, so we're sort of, we are in our own kind of wealth and comfort in some ways is sort of complicit in the maintaining the terrible fragility uh, of our uh, one planet society and taking on those things can seem just too big to do and especially the, uh, in the context of course of, of business uh, where employment is is so important um, and and where the people who get hold of power to make change are are those really who are able to are often able those who are able to offer some kind of answer for those questions about employment and wealth creation, even at these terrible costs? Uh, so, one planet business education can't avoid getting into these very difficult questions. It becomes inherently political, uh, and that is distasteful for some business students and some business educators. Uh, but it's absolutely necessary that we make ourselves capable of taking on those kinds of agendas. Um, and so the predicament of the one planet uh, means not only the environmental predicament of it, but the sense that we all have to get along together on this planet. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the other thing that, that uh, uh, can too easily happen, uh, I've, I've seen happen, is uh, that a, a sort of desire that our students 
uh, should all kind of look the same, should sort of conform to a model of the uh, of, of the sustainability oriented student. Um, and some of the difficulties that certainly I found, and I think some of my colleagues found, in the the tremendous diversity of students we attracted attract to the One Planet MBA, uh, is that uh, they they really don't always come in the kind of images that <laughs> we'd expected or projected. Um, I think that's a good thing. Well, I'm sure it's a good thing, uh, but it has really have to, had to make us. Uh, uh, reframe, rethink quite a lot of the educational processes. I mean, one example is that we've had just a range from people who come as the who come to an MBA as a break from being the serving sustainability manager in a, a major multinational companies, through to people who are you know, in their early twenties are being sent because their father owns. Uh, a, a chemical factory in Thailand, and uh, and they're expected to take over this this factory. And uh, the best compromise they could reach with a parent was to was to come and do a One Planet MBA rather than something else. Um, and uh, and so the sorts of dynamics that people, the range of interests and motivations and skills and knowledge that one deals with, is tremendous. You can't, you really just can't. Uh, uh, design and run a curriculum in the same way as you can in a in a program where you're where you're running it as a delivery mode. You know, if you think you, you know, I'm going to teach my stuff, you prepare your stuff and you teach it. But if you're going to respond to and encourage and support people to make the world more sustainable in the context in which they are, you have to be much more flexible and, uh, and open to it. And, um, uh, and those of you who are able to see even Goodstein's uh, um, uh, SCC webinar from I think last week, week before, uh, he dealt with some of this in relation to the Bard MBA. Um, oh, going the wrong way here. Um, so, so this is a picture by the uh, Belgian artist Nora Clays. I, I think captures for me the kind of sort of quality of the educational discussion that one's got to be involved in with people, um, and if, if you're really going to help help them to address what it is to deal with sustainability uh, in their business context and this kind of small group discussion a quality where you're actually really able to listen to each other to think about where someone else is coming from and what they're doing it's very hard to do in the uh, in an education system which is driven by uh, numbers basically by scale um, and and repeatability uh, so we really have to find ways of making use of course new technologies um, and uh, and ways of learning and engaging uh, I, one of the dangers we had uh, we found i think at exeter is that many people um because the faculty was so committed that they would kind of overcommit themselves and wear themselves out in trying to respond to this diversity uh, and uh, uh, one definitely doesn't want to start making your colleagues ill uh, with the demands that you have uh, for a mission-led, idealistic kind of education. Um, so I, I'm going to pause there. I, I think that gives us uh, 20 minutes or so um, and uh, for some questions. But I, I, if there is time after, I'd like to come back and show you a, a little bit more about this initiative called One Planet Education Networks, where we are now bringing together uh, people from business schools around the world and uh, faculty members and uh, consultants, experts working in industry to form a, a fellowship that will uh, really contribute to and support the kinds of changes I've been talking about uh, in business education. Um, but let me stop there and, and respond to questions uh, and comments if there are any. Let's start with uh, our host, Kim Smith. Kim, uh, I know that you are prepared to engage with Jonathan um, at this point. Thank you very much. Um, I, it's really fascinating to think through these deep questions as well as looking at art at the same time and, and seeing the inspiration that or imagery that um, resonated for you. Uh, so many of these are just 
you know, archetypal images of, of ourselves and how we engage with others. I'm really curious about um, the engagement side. I've got a couple questions, and I know we'll have a couple more that come up through the chat box, which Ira will share. The, the element of, of leadership and how you worked so hard to find that compromise, it's pretty amazing that folks were actually unanimous. Um, how were you able to motivate um, especially with, some, with the emphasis on leadership, how are you able to motivate and give hope to folks, even in the light of feeling disjointed? What kind of lessons do you have from your leadership work and teaching um, that motivate people to engage in this important work? Um, uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, firstly, there are, there are some people who, are more comfortable than others in belonging to a sort of, in fact, enjoy being part of a movement, part of a perhaps a count anti-authoritarian tribe or, or, or gang. Uh, and so I think some of them found that comfortable. Um, but of course, many people who worked in universities and business schools are very comfortable with a status-based hierarchy. And, uh, and these are often the people who, who comfortable with authority and have the authority so to move them uh, is a, a kind of p political challenge um, and I think some of the lessons that I, I learned are well main one is that it requires a lot of personal work so some people I think made the decision to support this move because they've the, the point in their careers where and saying let's do something interesting um, they've been doing the same thing all the time and they, they just want to we're actually attracted by doing something new and that's something that felt to be right uh, i think the idealism actually speaks louder than anything else by and large most people really do want to do what's right uh, and what's good and, and hope and hope filled um i think uh, uh some of the other things that were important is to do with of course the external environment it was a it, this was extraordinary in uh I, I would say in 2010 uh i think we made, this decision was made uh in the autumn uh, about december 2009 actually or january 2010 um and at that point uh, there were an awful lot of people who really thought sustainability was just a fad uh, it'll pass mm -hmm. you know people are keen on the environment now it'll go uh, and in that context, there were some people who did not think it was a fad, who had seen the data, who could see what was happening. And uh, when we started to do this, they may not have agreed with everything I was saying. They probably didn't agree with anything, but they thought at least someone is speaking to this seriously. It's an opportunity to do something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Would, would you mind putting your um, video back on so folks can see you while you're answering questions? Sure. Thank you. Um, so that's, th thank you, there you are. So when you're, just, what you, you just added something in that expanded a question of mine, of mine now with, uh, and so I'll just, I have just two more here. One, that story you had about the student, it, whose parents could be, you know, they, they're expected to take over the chemical factory or work within something that's um, not so sustainable. And yet the, the compromise then becomes, all right, well, I'll get an MBA, but how about if I get a one planet MBA? I think that's yeah. really, yeah. it's like, okay. So in that sense that it's no longer a fad, that it actually is legitimate, that these degrees have value and um, will be able to tie into broader initiatives. So given the broader initiatives, um, and also even for the faculty, I recognize the risk of them being burnt out, but also being really mission led, as you said. Um, re how could you explain your the one planet MBA, but also open. How are you tying the those to the SDGs? What intentional relationship do you have there? Um, the to tying them to the SDGs uh, in the one planet uh, MBA and the business education, I think, remains quite uh, problematic in terms of the content and the uh, the curriculum of the school uh, of the of the 
the program itself. Um, and this is because at a very general level, you can see, of course, that what we're doing uh, on the planet is dealing with the kinds of issues that are addressed by the SDGs. Um, occasionally, we, well, so not occasionally, actually, to be honest, every, every term and on pretty much every course, but, it, but there's a key, there are key moments where one makes, a, when, when one has to make some decisions and in one's own mind can orient something towards an SDG. So, for example, when I was uh, teaching a, a, a leadership in relation to, together with a, a colleague in supply chain, we were doing leadership in supply chains, um, and we had a we had a choice as to the kinds of case studies we would look at and the examples we'd look at, and we chose to look at water and sanitation, um, which is of course addressed in one of the SDGs, um, and we we used the sense that the, the the fact that this is an SDG target, an SDG, one of the SDGs, one of the goals, uh, and say right, this is what we're going to focus on. Uh, we also said, look, this is also something that that affects primarily or more than, and than others affects women and girls uh, and that the case studies we could draw on could show how it tied together big scale multinational uh, businesses dependent on water and uh, very local issues around access to education and health um, and, and sanitation and fresh water um, and uh, so I think in that sense, the linking to the SDGs can be quite a powerful rationale for choices made within the curriculum. Uh, but where we've tried to pull together groups of students or faculty members to say, come on, let's, let's do something that will have an impact on such and such an SDG, that has been, I think, less successful because the students have been, of course, understandably, mindful also of trying to uh, orient their energy towards where they think they're going to get a job um, mm -hmm. and this question of future employment and I'm now going to come on to open the one planet education network uh, is really a, a crucial one uh, we've uh, been struggling with the one planet MBA to get the message to employers that we're not training sustainability managers we're sustain we're training business managers uh, who understand that the business happens in a in a context of sustainability, um, and I think that uh, I know that other sustainability oriented MBAs, like the Bard and Presidio, amongst them, have had uh, similar challenges. And one of the things that we're we're doing with the One Planet Education Networks is to draw together uh, the all these sustainability oriented programs and uh, and, and organize uh, employment uh, fairs jobs fairs specifically uh, uh, the, for with employers who understand that message and are looking for those kinds of people and by pooling all these schools together we gives us a global uh, and uh, scale of graduates to direct towards mm -hmm. these jobs okay thank you um I have one or two more, but I see you've got a few folks who've, who've written in some questions. How about I turn it over to you and then um, then I can help wrap up with one more question? Okay, yeah, actually. Does that sound good? Very good. Uh, let me toss one out and uh, see if Jonathan would like to take on this question. Are you or any other B schools beginning to wrestle with curriculum for how to talk politics? that is do what you said recognize the distastefulness but the necessity to deal with it um yes I, it's a it, it, it's a good question i i think that um there are a lot of business schools across europe that are really recognizing this and, and a lot of places i go to uh this is really what we're addressing our phd students and so on this likewise um because one of the lessons of the Paris Accord is the, of course, the political uh, shenanigans that went into the Copenhagen before that, uh, and the attempts to get that to happen. And very interestingly, the role of multinational, particularly the big multinational businesses, in working sometimes with NGOs and with governments to get things to happen. So the, the sort of big scale politics uh, is is really crucial to understand understanding how systemic change happens and um and i think 
and, and also in my own leadership teaching, I now I've shifted really to including quite a significant input into what one might call the tactics of power. Um, because a lot of leadership is taught as if it's all to do with some sort of personal qualities and persuasive abilities and, and opportunities for influencing others and so on and collaborating with others. Um, but it's, it's, you know, things get done in this large scale change really through tactics, uh, tactics such as um, a patronage, nepotism, um, uh, tactics of populism, uh, tactics of uh, fear, uh, intimidation, and people need to understand these things. Um, uh, so we're, we're, not, we're not teaching to say you should go out and intimidate people, but but I think it, you have got to understand the extent to which organization choices people make are influenced by uh, where they feel the power is and how it's being exercised. Um, yeah. Very good. Uh, I will turn it back to Kim to ask her remaining question. But first, I'll note that uh, another Sustainability Curriculum Consortium Advisory Council member, uh, Matt Polsky, had posted in the chat box um, a link um, to an article that he had written last year that also talks about the connection between incremental and transformational change. So that link is in the chat box for those of you who are online and accessing it. Um, other than, a, than several other thank yous uh, for a great presentation from other at attendees, uh, I'm not seeing other questions or comments for Jonathan right now. Uh, perhaps others will pop up, Kim, while you ask your question. Okay. Yeah, and I appreciate the mention of that um, article or the, the work on um, Jonathan. I don't know if you can see this, but it says on 40 years watching the sustainable business field. So it is a, a wonderful thing to have fresh, new, young folks joining. And then also all of the folks who have experience and wisdom over the years, um, experience trying to navigate these difficult relationships within our own departments or institutions, but also around the world. And the complexities, of course, of our politics. Um, so, I, but I want to think about the the institution itself within, and or how beyond um, just the business schools. What uh, I know that within the Open Fellows that you have a variety of different disciplines. I'm curious what you think uh, is the value of other disciplines to helping business schools and the and business education move forward towards a sustainable future. Well, I, I, I think it's it's clear that uh, that there are areas. Uh, well, you, you know, your own area, sociology, uh, is really crucial for people to understand how uh, power works, how exclusion and inclusion works, and the uh, possibilities that there are for organisation in ways that are perhaps not familiar in business uh, for people to exercise solidarity. I think there's also tremendous. Uh, significance, as we know clearly, in the world of technology um, and and climate science. Uh, are, well, they could certainly need extra. The climate scientists are more and more present in the MBA suite uh, because people really want to know what's what's actually happening here. What's what's the what's the degrees of certainty? What are the what are the uh, um, things that are likely to happen? International relations and politics. Um, I think there's another aspect that tends to happen. Uh, sadly in uh, business education is there's a, a sort of desire often to get everything uh, down kind of hardwired so there's been a lot of emphasis on systemic thinking which you think systemically the interconnections between things which very often reduces to a, a huge piece of paper with lots of arrows and, and boxes and uh, attempts to quantify um, critical paths and uh, dependencies and so on um, and I think uh, what that does is sort of rob something of the sort of liveliness and the sense of joy and happiness and interaction in the world and, and of course, the sadness and loss. Uh, I mean, Habermas had this wonderful phrase that the, the life world is in constant struggle with the system. Oh. Um, and I think, it, I think it's very evocative, that. Uh, and I, we must make sure that our business education allows space for the life world both experientially um, 
and of course, as one opens up to that and and and, and who is enabled to to recognise uh, just what it is to be alive, to be human, one can also then opens one's eyes to other people, a sense of connection with them, and to nature. Uh, and and so one of the key uh, modules in the, in the one plant MBA is, is actually biomimicry, um, which is partly about the technical possibility of mimicking nature, but it's also about um, kind of allowing something of natural rhythm and uh, how we are enjoyment, pleasure. Mm -hmm. pleasure. Yeah, and your use of, the, of arts and the humanities and philosophy and all of this is really in many ways requires a liberal arts way of, of thinking about the world and not that narrow definition of one discipline or one um, specialty on a technical side. Uh, it, it would I would really like to see much more engagement across the disciplines and seeing that each of us has our areas in which we can provide um, wisdom and experience as well as opportunities for collaboration. So hopefully um, your the open the one planet education networks program as well as the um, relationships you have with WWF and the sustainable development goals will open opportunities for folks across disciplines across sectors to engage in this very meaningful work. Um, so that's my, my my final thought, and I want to great express my gratitude for your reflections and and um, opportunity to learn from you. Ira, would you like to say some closing words? And Jonathan as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, first of all, my thanks from SEC perspective for your willingness to uh, help us launch our international webinar series. Uh, I consider it a, a, a very successful launch, and uh, I'll echo one of the comments in the chat box, uh, appreciating your reflections, and you've provided excellent food for thought. Uh, Kim, I also want to thank you for all of your efforts in structuring this international series. I don't know if you have the uh, full list of your handiwork in front of you um, and would like to share uh, who we have lined up for the next three. If you don't have that handy, I, I do, uh, but would rather give you the honor of saying a few more words about how we see the international series playing out. Mm -hmm. and who's coming up next? Sure, uh, thank you. And I know that you are there, and if folks have not um, participated in other SCC um, webinars, there are many more um, that are either discipline-based or pedagogical uh, uh, questions. So do pay attention to the themes and different speakers that are coming up. But for our international uh, set series, in April, we have two speakers. Juan Jung Byun, with who is a senior project editor officer with UNESCO, will be speaking about her work um, through ed with education for sustainable development. In addition to um, her work with RCE Tongyong in South Korea, Wednesday, April 25th, we'll be having Leanne Denby, the director of sustainability at Macquarie University, as well as president of the Australasian campuses towards sustainability. That's the AXE program. And uh, she has been very active in, in international work. Um, Jonathan and I both uh, met her in Rio, and uh, she helped us advance the higher education sustainability initiative. So for all of us in higher education uh, institutions, we want to express a lot of gratitude to the leadership um, folks have had around the world in the Global Alliance. And um, I'll mention just one more. In May, we'll have, uh, we're trying to really have representation from around the world. So we'll have, I believe we've landed on May 14th, we'll have Rob O'Donoghue from Rhodes University in South Africa and Uni um, Haya Palim, Palimana from India. Both are specialists in biodiversity and traditional knowledge. And um, Uni is with them. Um, and Robert, both with United Nations University. So really looking forward to their uh, expertise and uh, interesting talks. More information will be shared and Ira will be sending out advertisements with details on those sessions. Very good. I think we can wrap up there. Thanks again so much, Jonathan and Kim, uh, for this great webinar today. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. For the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks to all. Goodbye.